Hi. Today I want to talk about one of the most important arguments in favor of realism, and correspondingly one of the most uh, clear-cut and serious arguments against idealism. It's called the missing explanation argument. It appears first, I think, in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, where, although he describes his own view as transcendental idealism, he has a section entitled The Refutation of Idealism, and he presents essentially this argument. But Kant is notoriously difficult to follow. Instead, I want to talk about this in literary form, in the thought of Jorge Luis Borges. Borges has a story that is really based around the missing explanation argument and the conflict between realism and idealism. Who was Borges? Well, he's the most philosophical of short story writers, the greatest writer of the 20th century, surely never to have won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was Argentinian, got into a great deal of trouble in Argentina for being a pro-democracy acti activist. He had a job in the National Library. He was consigned to a position which kept him in the basement most of the time, uh, invisible. But the advantage of it was that he could do the job in about an hour a day and had the rest of the time to read and to write. Eventually, he got into trouble even doing that. And so the government, to try to placate him, fired him, but offered him the job of inspector of rabbits and chickens. He turned that down to become an international lecturer and a visiting scholar at the University of Texas, where he was one of the key people starting our Latin American Studies program. And in fact, here are some photographs you can see of Borges, many of them taken on this campus. This is him on the South Mall talking with a variety of students. And there you see what students here looked like in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Well, what is the argument for idealism that Borges is dealing with? And by the way, I should say, Borges often plays with philosophical arguments and philosophical conceptions in his short stories. He also writes some essays, for example, A New Refutation of Time. And so he's often thinking about issues connected to idealism and realism. In some works, he seems to be arguing in favor of idealism. In other works, he seems to be arguing in favor of realism. It's hard to identify his own philosophical views. I think he's more interested in exploring philosophical conceptions, understanding philosophical arguments, and putting them in what he considers the most powerful form. Well, here is a traditional argument for idealism. Suppose the world is independent of the mind. How could we know anything about it? The world might be different, even though all of our perceptions, all of our thoughts about it might be the same. We'd have no way of knowing which way the world truly is. So we could have perceptions, and the world might be the way that our perceptions reflect it. It might be that we're suffering some kind of hallucination or dream or illusion. We could be tricked by an evil deceiver, as in Descartes' example. We could be brains in bats. And so there are lots of possibilities that would suggest that maybe we could be having exactly the perceptions we have now, and yet they would not at all be accurate representations of reality. How could we tell? If the world is truly independent of us, it would seem there's no way to sort of get across that divide between mind and world and reassure ourselves that we're actually perceiving things and understanding things the way they are. Well, in that way, classical arguments for skepticism become arguments for idealism. If the world is really independent of the mind, it looks like we can't have any knowledge of it. The only way to have knowledge of the world would be to treat the world as a mental construction. So Berkeley, for example, says that to be is to be perceived. What he's doing is saying, look, to be an object in the world is to be mind-dependent from the very beginning. It is to be perceived. It is the something, something that later idealists trying to be a little more careful say, well, it's at least to be perceivable. It's the kind of thing that can be represented in a mind. And their view is that makes it mind-dependent. So there simply is no gap. Well, Borges' story is based on the idea that there could be an entire planet that was convinced by Berkeley's arguments and was thoroughly idealistic. I think most of us in our common sense attitudes about the world and in our language act as if we're realists. But suppose that weren't true. Suppose our language, suppose our basic ways of thinking, our common sense was thoroughly idealist. What would that look like? Well, Borges describes a planet called Tlon. And here's how it goes. Hume noted for all time that Berkeley's arguments did not admit the slightest refutation, nor did they cause the slightest conviction. This dictum is entirely correct in application to the Earth. 
but entirely false in Chlan. The nations of this planet are congenitally idealist. Their language and the derivations of their language, religion, letters, metaphysics, all presuppose idealism. The world for them is not a concourse of objects in space, it's a heterogeneous series of independent acts. Well, Borges goes through in some detail what such a conception would look like. If the idealist is right, then the basic units of the world are what the Buddhists refer to as dharmas, these mental episodes, these independent acts that are fundamentally mental. And then we group those together into objects if we want to. We group them together into episodes we consider events. We do all of the combining and constructing of whatever kind of object we create out of that. There is no intrinsic identity to any of those objects. In fact, if we were to speak a language that was thoroughly idealistic, we would think, really, we should be just naming these mental episodes. We should not be talking about objects at all. So indeed, in versions of this language, and he goes through this, there are different languages in different parts of the planet, but we would have no nouns, for example. Instead of moon, we might say silvery orb-like. Um, it's actually very hard to do this. It might be that we would just have verbs, um, you know, shining. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how to say in the sky and so on. It's, it's very difficult to do this. But in any case, we would really not have any nouns. We would, if we had any at all, they would just refer to these acts. And so really we would just have verbs, we might have adjectives. It would look like all of this was a way of just saying everything is really some kind of mental construction. The world is just a series of these heterogeneous acts. Sometimes we combine them, we refer to things, but it's really just light, silvery airy, you know, <laughs> instead of the moon. And so there is no way to really think about things in anything like the way we think about things ordinarily if idealism is right. Now on this planet, things go along swimmingly for a long time, but then a heresy arises. It is the heresy of materialism, the heresy of realism, really, that there are such things as objects in the world. It's not just a series of mental episodes, but there are real things that are independent of us. And here is the story that prompts this heresy. On Tuesday, X crosses a deserted road and loses nine copper coins. On Thursday, Y finds in the road four coins somewhat rusted by Wednesday's rain. On Friday, Z discovers three coins on the road. On Friday morning, X finds two coins in the corridor of his house. Well, a simple enough story, and here's how to think of it in a chart. On Tuesday, one person loses these nine coins. Well, nothing happens until Thursday when Y finds four of them on the road. And then on Friday, X, the beginning, finds two there in his house. He must have had a hole in his pocket and they fell out even before he left the house. And three others are found by Z out on the road. And so intuitively, we'd say, well, I see what happened. Sure, uh, the guy loses nine coins from a leaky pocket, and he later finds two of them, but seven are lost. They're found eventually by other people. Big deal, right? That's not a very interesting story. And indeed, if you're a realist, it's like, well, yeah, there's no big deal to that story at all. Guy loses some coins, finds a few of them, other people find the rest. Yeah, big deal. Why is that a heresy on the planet of Tlon? Well, the answer is there's no way to talk about the coins, <laughs> okay? There are no objects. They're just a series of heterogeneous acts. So what happens? Somebody experiences an episode of coin losing. And actually, we can't even say coin losing because we don't have any nouns, but it's something like, yeah, um, yeah, coppery, I can't say pocket. Um, it's really hard to do this. But whatever you would say, say yeah, I exp you know, experience of loss of nine coins, as we would put it. And then later, that guy has a finding experience of two coins, and two other people have these kinds of experiences. Well, gosh, I mean, there's no con continuity here at all. It's as if I, I walked down the street and I heard laughter. And then three days later, you walk down the street, you hear laughter. We're not tempted at all to say, hey, it's the same laughter. Wow, what I heard, you heard it too. <laughs> no, it's just different, right? And it would be the same on Tlon here with the coins. Oh, you had a coin losing experience. You had a coin finding experience. Huh, there's no way to correlate them to one another and think there's some connection here. 
And so the fact that X and Y and Z added together found nine coins when earlier X had lost nine coins? To the realist, that seems significant. There's no way for the idealist even to talk about the connection there. It's just like, well, how funny. It's like you and I both dreamt about snakes last night or something like that. It has no more significance. Well, the heresiarch would deduce from this story the reality. That is to say, the continuity of the nine coins which were recovered. It's absurd, he affirmed, to imagine that four coins have not existed between Tuesday and Thursday, three between Tuesday and Friday afternoon, and two between Tuesday and Friday morning. It's logical to think they've existed, at least in some secret way, hidden from the comprehension of men at every moment of those periods. Well, the realist can say that, can say, yeah, they were lost out in the road, or in the house, in the case of the two that had fallen out of the pocket before the fellow left the house. And so it's no big mystery. Yes, they existed unperceived. But wait, I thought to be was to be perceived. If to be is to be perceived, then they're perceived at a certain time, then they're just unperceived for two days by anyone. It's as if they go out of existence. But of course, there's no they to go out of existence. It's just an episode of one kind, an episode of another kind. I say yesterday, hey, I, you know, I saw this blue thing. You say, huh, today I saw some, something blue. And <laughs> we don't link those together and say, oh, you saw it too. It, it's not like that, right? They're just separate episodes. And so it would be the same here. The heresy is, come on, they're not separate episodes. <laughs> there is a connection. There were coins. The coins were lost. And then those very coins were found. Well, here is the general idea behind the argument. Realism explains our experiences. Suppose everything were mind-dependent. Why are there regularities in my experiences? First of all, why does your experience align with mine? Realism explains this. Idealism has no explanation. Let's think first about why my experiences cohere in a certain way. It's not that obvious that they should cohere, but they do. I mean, think about this. I'm going to snap my fingers, and I will have that mental episode of intention. I will then have a perception of them snapping, first based on feeling, and then I will hear the sound of them snapping. Wow! Intention! And that feeling, and then a noise. Oh. Wow, what a coincidence. Well, of course, the realist, what do you mean, what a coincidence? That's ridiculous. They're obviously connected mental acts. I have the intention, then I actually make the decision to do it, and I feel myself do it, and then my ears pick up the sound. And visually, I can look at this, because I'm aware of the fingers doing this at the time. All of those things are, of course, coordinated. And it happens across minds, too. You hear them as well. And so it's no big mystery. I mean, how shocking. I hear a finger snap. You hear a finger snap. What are the odds? Well, the odds are very high, says the realist. It's no mystery. Of course that happens. I clap my hands, and I hear it, and you hear it. That was a pathetic hand clap. That sort of thing is commonplace. And look, it happens in all sorts of other ways as well. Play the game that toddlers play. Peekaboo. <laughs> okay, the toddler is surprised, like, oh, where'd you go? Oh, you're there. And then the game loses its charm. Once they figure out, oh yeah, objects have a continua continuous existence. They, in effect, the baby, before say six months old, is an idealist. They just think they're these disconnected mental episodes. There you are. Now you're gone. You're back again. Oh, <laughs> okay. Once the baby becomes a realist, somewhere between six and nine months, it's like, yeah, big deal. Yeah, you were there and you were hiding behind your hands. Yeah, it's, the game loses its charm. Well, Borges' point is that for a, an idealist, taking all this seriously and basing their entire language and their entire way of thinking on idealism, they would be like that baby. They would be like the baby who hasn't figured out causation and the persistence of objects and so on. Everything would be a surprise. You disappear, you reappear. <gasps> You hear the sound. It's astounding, right? Big accident. This guy loses coins. Later, people find coins. Wow, what are the chances of that? 
Of course, the realist says, yeah, <laughs> the chances of that are very good. I mean, maybe they're totally lost, but right. I mean, come on. It's not that mysterious. There's no mystery to this at all. However, there would be if we didn't have those continuing objects. Because the realist says, look, there are actual fingers that have an existence independently of my mind. They actually make noise. It is because of this thing in the world, the fingers, that all of that fits together. And the same thing is true of the hand clap. The same thing is true when I hide my eyes and then reappear. Yeah, come on, there's a thing in the world, right? And we're perceiving it, we stop perceiving it, we start perceiving it again. No big mystery. However, that kind of coordination among the different senses, among, uh, you might say, things that are mental episodes at slightly different times, that's shocking to the idealist. There's no explanation for that at all, it would appear. And so it's a, a weird kind of story. In fact, <laughs> Borges says, in Tlan, this story became, I mean, most people didn't even understand the story. They didn't get the point because they don't, they don't have any way of saying coin and getting across the idea that it might be the same object. Others said, look, it begs the question. Um, it's no more the same coins than if I had a pain in my shoulder and then a few days later, you had a pain in your shoulder. You wouldn't say, whoa, the same pain. And so why should we say same coins? Just, huh, coincidence, they all add up to nine. That's, that's a weird way of looking at things, but it's, it's the way the idealist he thinks would have to look at them. Now. There's a way of taking this argument and adjusting it if you don't find it entirely convincing. Suppose the idealist can say something and we're gonna look at various things they could say. Maybe they can tell you some kind of story. But we could say, look, realism is surely the simplest explanation of our experiences. Suppose the idealist is actually right, that everything is mind dependent and the world consists of this heterogeneous series of independent acts. Suppose things don't really exist, at least substances as we ordinarily think of them don't really exist. Suppose they don't obey natural laws when we're not looking at them. Well, maybe, but it's a lot simpler to suppose they do. If we think about things like hand claps, finger snaps, and so on, we realize that different people positioned around the room are gonna hear them at different times. And in fact, it becomes a problem if you're a musician. If you're hearing what is being played around you, at different times because of echoes, reverberations in the room, you're gonna be in big trouble. I have sung Bach's Christmas Oratorio in a room where I was in the bass section off on the side. <laughs> and most of the sound that I was hearing was bouncing off a wall nearby and bouncing back to the bass section. Most of the choir and the orchestra were projecting out into the hallway, but it was a big, long, cross-shaped building and we were off in one of the arms of the cross, which meant by the time I'm hearing the violins, the crowd heard them God, several hundred milliseconds ago, and so the basses were having a lot of trouble. We had to simply learn, do not listen to what's going on around you. Watch the conductor and just follow what's going on with the conductor. It won't be in time with the music but that's okay, follow the conductor. It'll sound like you're constantly singing early, but if you start listening to the violins and the sopranos, you're dead. And indeed, yeah, that, that was tricky, but it indicates, well, yeah, how can we explain that? As realists, it's not that simple. We have to think about sound waves and reverberations and timing and so forth. But if you're an idealist, how do you say that? It's not just two different people hearing things at the same time. They're actually hearing things at different times, but they're hearing the same thing. You're hearing that D major chord, but at slightly different, you know, say 300 milliseconds apart. How do you explain that? Well, that's just weird and random from the point of view of an idealist, presumably. It's way simpler to suppose, look, there really are objects there and there are real sound waves that bounce off real walls and come back to the ear and so on and so forth. Okay, well, we can even broaden this argument as Bertrand Russell does. Why do we all eventually agree on certain things, right? We investigate scientifically and often disagreements persist for a long period of time. There's some questions that remain unknown, but often we converge. In fact, the pragmatist defines truth in terms of that kind of convergence of opinion on something. Often we do eventually agree on some proposition, let's say P. Well, a realist can say, here's why we do that. 
Because it's true, and because the evidence and reasoning eventually leads us to the truth. But what could the idealist say? What could the pragmatist say? If we think, no, 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 truth is a matter of just eventually reaching this agreement, that's what truth is, eventually we'll agree on it, why do we agree on it? What's the explanation for that? And if there is an explanation, why should we think that that makes it true? Maybe it just means there are a few bullies in the crowd who force everybody else to agree. And so it looks like we've got to have some kind of explanation of why convergence in opinion, consensus, agreement, might be any kind of indicator of truth. The realist can say, well, because we tend to agree because our ideas, you know, we're trying to match them to the world, which is independent of us. When we succeed, hey, we end up agreeing with one another. But it's not clear what the idealist could say. Let's take a simple example. Here is a cat in a tree, my cat Zadok. Well, the realist can explain why you and I both see the cat in the tree. The realist says that image of the cat is affecting my perception and affecting your perception. I have a causal relationship going between that image and then what's in my mind, also what's in your mind. There is something that is independent of our minds out there in the world, namely that cat, or in this case, the photograph, the image of the cat. But what can the idealist say? The idealist turns those arrows around. You and I are both projecting an image of a cat. Well, what a coincidence. How is that possible? What explains the fact that you and I are both doing that? Barclay has to say something like this. Well, that cat is an idea in the mind of God. And God is revealing that to us and putting it in both of our minds at the same time. Well, that seems fanciful. <laughs> why is God doing that? And why does God put it in everybody's mind right at this moment? Why now? Why at the same time? Anyway, looks like, well, I guess that's a kind of explanation. Since God can do anything, I guess God could do that. But it seems like a strange way of thinking about this. What about Kant? Well, he uses this missing explanation argument to say there have to be things in themselves. But then the problem is, well, what are they? What can we say about them? The answer is nothing. So there is something, I know not what, that is in some way responsible for those two perceptions. We can't just say, yeah, there's an image of a cat in a tree. There is instead some mysterious noumenon, something, I know not what, that is making us respond in this way. What can Hegel say? Well, there's some kind of historically conditioned, um, yeah, I mean, we both have this historically conditioned concept of physical objects and cats and animals and so on, but we're both seeing a cat in a tree here. How do you explain that? How does talking about historical conditioning help? Not at all clear. Nietzsche, I have no idea what to say. Underlying biochemistry, the will to power, I don't know. <laughs> and the solipsist has, in a way, the most outrageous conclusion. Uh, only one of us truly exists. There's only one mind here. You and I must be the same person. <laughs> There haven't, <laughs> I can't say this without laughing, there haven't been many solipsists in the history of philosophy. Of course, solipsists would say, yeah, there's only been one, they believe me. Um, there was one person, Elie J. Brower, the founder of intuitionism, a school of mathematical philosophy, uh, and uh, an approach to mathematics, who really did write about the mathematician and meant himself. He, he was a solipsist, <laughs> um, kind of a lonely life because you believe that you're the only person in the universe. Well, then this problem of coordination doesn't occur between people, but it can still occur. Why do you think about this problem or have the perception of the cat turn away and then you turn back and there it is again. So actually, as the Buddhists are well aware, getting rid of other people in the world won't really solve the problem. You still have yourself at this time and yourself at another time and the same problem arises. Well, it's as if we have two theaters that are playing exactly the same movie at the same time, or at least at closely coordinated times, that looks like that calls out for some kind of explanation. Certainly that can happen, but we kind of know, well, they're, they're playing the same digital file, they've got the same film, uh, wh what's happening here? And we think there ought to be an explanation, not that it's simply chance or that God decided that it would be this way. Well, here's what <laughs> worries Borges in this story. He doesn't rest content by saying, hey, the, the heresy of materialism wins in the world of Tlon. It doesn't win. And in fact, it's worse than that. The fantasy world of Tlon begins invading our reality. This encyclopedia 
begins to circulate, people start contributing additional volumes, everybody starts thinking as if they were residents of Tlon. So Orbis Tertius, which is simply Latin for third world, publishes a version of the Encyclopedia of Tlon that catches the public ima imagination. Reality begins to yield. People begin acting as if this world of Tlon is our reality. Borges says, the truth is that it longed to yield. Now why? Why would it long to yield? He's writing this story just at the outbreak of World War II. He publishes it in 1940. And he talks explicitly about Marxism, about Nazism, about other ideologies that have this sort of approach, this kind of, broadly speaking, idealistic attitude about reality. Not always in the sense that they embrace idealism. Classical Marxism is thoroughly materialist in its outlook. But nevertheless, they have this kind of attitude that, well, that ideology is critically important. And Borges is worried about that growing reliance on ideology. He says, how could one do other than submit to Tlon, to the minute and vast evidence of an orderly planet? It is useless to answer that reality is also orderly. Perhaps it is. But in accordance with divine laws, I translate inhuman laws, which we never quite grasp. Tlon is surely a labyrinth, but it's a labyrinth devised by men, a labyrinth destined to be deciphered by men. The appeal of Tlon, the appeal of this sort of idealism and ideology, is precisely rationalism. It promises a rational order to the world and an order that people can understand. A labyrinth, but a labyrinth that we constructed and so we can describe and we can find the solution to. That's the appeal. In the introductory section to Witness, Whitaker Chambers writes about the appeal of communism in his own life. And he uses exactly that sort of language. He says, it was rationalism. It was the appeal of a world built on reason that made me join the Communist Party. And it was later that I realized this was an illusion, that reality wasn't like that. But Borges, already in 1940, is looking at the rise of a variety of ideologies, conflicting ideologies, and saying, this is like the creeping of Tlon, <laughs> the creeping of this idealism overtaking people's ideas of reality. He's alarmed by it, but he thinks there is a power here, a power based ironically on reason, that it's very hard to resist.